you know, spirit asks us one thing. Spirit asks us to show up. To show up and be present. And so here I am, and I am with you all. <laughs> and this... <laughs> And I just love the synchronicity of the sharing, the idea of passion, the one power, because it moves through, you know, what my talk is about, which is one of the stories of creation. And um, uh, I was asking myself, well, I have to be real honest. The reason that I took this back to the Bible is that I've just been having a ball working with this Bible class on uh, Tuesday night and doing the research and looking at a different perspective of what the Bible stories are. Because whether or not we're even familiar with them, because of the culture that we live in, they impact our lives. And the difficulty is when someone says, well, I read it in the Bible, or don't you read the Bible? The first question is, well, which Bible are you talking about? I mean, there's the King James Version, which I understand that if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. That was a joke. <laughs> the King James Version, I believe, was written in like 1492 or something like that. It's a pretty modern version. But there are the history of the Bible. I mean, there were just so many different Bibles. Every country had a different Bible for a while. And slowly but surely as, you know, Christianity and Catholicism conquered the world or parts of the world, those Bibles disappeared. And so we ha when we look at the Bible, we have to remember that for the most part, the original documents at some point in time were all destroyed. Because, you know, when the great library libraries in the Middle East were destroyed, all the papers went. And so the Bible and the stories that we get from it are some recreations and commentaries. And uh, we know that what we call the Bible and the selection of the books, it was put together at a time when a pope said, you know, we're all going to be Christian now. And there were certain books that went in the Bible and certain books that were left out of the Bible. But nonetheless, they make up, the books of the Apocrypha, they make up the whole Bible history. And each of these books, even like the New Testament and that, are written for, like we would do, for an intended audience with an intended plan, okay? Um, there are, I believe it's the, the Gospel of Matthew that was written for the Gentiles and so that they would start to legitimize, uh, uh, you know, uh, Christianity and come over to it. And so... We, we look at these stories, we have to go back and we say, what was the intention of the author or authors? Sometimes the reason the Bible doesn't make any sense is that in men's sentence it changes authors, I think. I mean, I don't know that it actually does that. But in the book, in the, the story of creation, there's not one story of creation, there's two stories of creation. There's not one story about the, the uh, creation of uh, Adam and Eve, there are two stories. Which one's right? I don't know. But if we look at both of them, if we look at the idea behind it, we might glean some truth out of it. Now, I want to talk about creation, Adam and Eve, and ask you, uh, well, why would that be important? Why would a story about a creation of Adam and Eve be important? What do we get from it? Where did you learn about relationships? Where do you think the ideas of what marriage is Okay, what children are. Where do you think those ideas came from? They came from the seeds in these books. And th over the course of time, meanings and usage have changed. The wonderful thing is that we can find some threads through the ancient Hebraic manuscripts and commentaries that sort of give us an idea of the common threads, even though, you know, they may or may not show up in the, what, we, what we see as the Bible story. And so this story sets the basis for relationships. And relationships are very important. We live in a relative world, right? God put us here, or God is... What we learn in the Bible class is that God involves itself 
it, 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 there's an involution of God in its creation. And from that is an evolution or the experience. And, um, and so, um, let's see, what, whoops, what were you talking about, senior moments? <laughs> Well, in the, um, one of the ideas that, uh, that surrounds the, the story of creation is that uh, God actually, it was a belief that the gods tried to work out all of their problems with humans. And, and so the stories, oftentimes, of humans are the story of the gods. In this case, the god is going to enter into its creation. And um, I just want to go back to one part that the first thing that was created was the light. Now, the sun and the stars were way after, way after, but light. And the light represents a Hebrew concept called Shekinah, which is the feminine aspect of God. It is invisible. It is part of that one power, okay? And the feminine aspect, that subconscious mind, the power that is in that is the power of creation. And in the garden, the Shekinah hides in the plants, okay? And in order to discover this, Adam and Eve, of course, have to listen and learn from the plants. But the Shekinah is the hidden force. This is the same hidden force in us that is, rides mostly on our intuitive feeling nature. Now, Adam uh, represents, you know, the, the first man. He wasn't male. He was an aspect of male and female. And in fact, until Eve was born, he really wasn't a man because there was no, he was both male and female. And he finds himself in the garden. And the reason that God put Adam in the garden was because he didn't create rain. That's, this is in the second story, by the way. I'm just sort of trying to pick up some other little pieces for you. Because we went, oh man, it was created to do this, this. Well, in reality, God needed someone to water the plants. <laughs> Tend to the environment. Nourish it. Help subdue it. Now, why would we be directed to subdue nature? I lived in the Northwest, and what I discovered in the power of the blackberry was that if you let it grow, it will take over everything, everything. And so Adam was needed in the garden to tend to nature. And he learned from nature. Because, you know, when Adam, and we, these are little tidbits you don't get when you just read the Bible, but when you're the first man, you have no memory. You have no memory, and there are certain concepts that you don't have because you have no memory, okay? And so he has to learn as he goes, and he learns from the plants how to take care of them, what they need. You know, in, the, um, in many traditions, you know, like the trees, the rishis in India were wise teachers. And in the Bible story, when we get down to the trees, we're going to learn that perhaps in Christianity and Judaism, the trees are also wise teachers. So Adam was doing his thing, and God was making things. And there's, you know, there's a couple of ways the different stories go, but basically God would make things and give them to Adam to name. Now, why would Adam get involved in that? I would think it would get boring after a rel relatively short period of time. But what Adam believed was because he watched nature. He saw animals reproduce. He knew that somewhere his helpmate was there because it existed everywhere in nature. And so Adam moves through the garden, naming this and naming that, looking for his love, looking for that aspect of him that will reflect back to him who he is. Because another disadvantage of being in the garden at this point in time is he can't see himself. He can only see out. And so he's looking for that helpmate who will reflect back to him who he is. 
This is oftentimes why we get into relationships with one another, to reflect, reflect back to us who we are. Now, the commandment to not only Adam and Eve, but to all of creation was be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And of course, this be fruitful and multiply, you know, plants got it, the animals got it, and the humans got the message too, which as you move through history, there were certain religious leaders who thought that be fruitful and multiply was not so good. In fact, that sex was a sin. Hooey, <laughs> hooey. <laughs> How else would the garden regenerate? How else would man expand? And the commandment to all creation was to cover the earth. So we were never meant to be all alone in one little place. We were meant to multiply and be fruitful with our lives and grow and cover our earth with our mission. Well, Adam knew he was lonely, and there's a part of all of us that experiences a type of loneliness that comes from being an individual, because we know that we perceive the world as we see it, as we think it, as we speak it, but we can't really know how you see, think, or feel. We can only understand what we think of that, and so there's a certain loneliness that we have where we want to share ourselves. We want to be known. One of the basic uh, psychological um, elements that any healthy human being needs is a sense of being known, that someone knows you, as well as that someone thinks you're special. It's important to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship well, the story of Eve comes about. She is, well, in one story, they're just sort of placed in the garden. And in another story, <laughs> they're sort of created over time. <laughs> and actually, in the first story of creation, when God said, we'll make them in our image and likeness and did and put them in the garden, male and female. Well, in the old Hebraic story, the Eve of that time was called Lilith. And she wasn't the little, she wasn't the, she was the first wife. But she was displeasing, and so she was sort of voted out of the garden. The Lilith comes back. Eve is taken from the rib of Adam. And what this is, this doesn't mean that, you know, women are subservient to men or anything else. What it means is, is that she was not created of the dust of the earth like Adam. She was created of the same substance. And what Adam learns in this creation, even though he's in a deep sleep, okay? Some stories say in that deep sleep he's off with Lilith. <laughs> you have to Google Lilith to learn more. <clears throat> but when he comes out of that sleep, he has a memory. He remembers a time before Eve. He remembers that. And he has learned something that's very important to us. It's called self-creation. So now things don't have to come magically out of the air because through our self, our relationship with the one power, one presence within us, we create. Time is getting by me, and I've got to move on here. <laughs> okay. um, so self-creation leads to something else called self-knowledge. Before you can be in a relationship with another person, you have to know who you are. If you don't, likelihood is you'll just be a sponge or a parasite on another person, but you have to know who you are. Self-knowledge is gained through experience. In the garden, everything is wonderful. There's no loss, there's no death, there's no disease. It's just all wonderful. But that's not how we grow. We grow when we have problems. I hate to say it. But the reason that things come to us, our challenges, our problems, 
is our opportunities for growth. We learn through our mistakes. That's the only way we can go forward, learning by trying, by doing. So in that sense, let's reconsider what actually happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. They meet a snake. Now, the snake in many cultures is considered another god. But for our purposes, it is an energy that is able to separate. It is able to distinguish. And so it goes to Eve, and she's the feeling nature, and sometimes the snake is the sense nature, and the sense tempts the feeling nature, and she eats the apple. But what the snake did by basically calling God a liar, that's why the, the book doesn't go into a lot of this, but, you know, if God knew everything, why would Adam and Eve, you know, need to know good and bad? Or it's not good and evil, okay? They, the snake gave Adam and Eve a gift, not a sin. The gift was that they were different than all the animals. That they had free will. And of course, God created us to have free will. And when we have free will, the first thing we have to accept is that we are free to make mistakes. And it is through our mistakes that we grow, that we learn. Consider that when God, quote-unquote, condemned Adam and Eve, I'm going to send you out from the garden, and you're going to toil by the sweat of your brow, and there's going to be thorns and thistles in your fields, and childbirth is going to be painful. Well, maybe another way of looking at that from a, an agriculture society perspective is that yeah, there's going to be problems in your field. You're going to learn from them. You're going to deal with them. Okay? That's how you gain experience. That's how you grow. And as far as the pain of childbirth goes, I find it very interesting that there is a way to look at this story as the development of the physical brain. Okay? Um, and I really lost that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay, let's see. Um, yes, okay. Uh, um, and, uh, oh, the creation of the physical brain, yes. And what happens over time, and you can go back and you can read the science of the, you know, whatever millions of years we've been here, and one of the things that we know is that through experience, the brain gets bigger. It creates, we're pl our brains are plastic. We build larger brains. And so perhaps the story in the Bible is not how painful childbirth is going to be. Because today, most people understand that natural childbirth does not have to be painful. That the pain of childbirth can be a frame of mind and that the reason there might be larger, more pain, is that as a species, our brain would get larger. So it wouldn't travel down the birth canal as easily. But it wasn't a judgment. It wasn't a condemnation. There's lots and lots of symbols in this story. The tree of knowing is something that, you know, from the apple, yada, 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 but we have to eat of that tree of life. When they left the garden, and a lot's left out, they continued to eat of the tree of knowing. They had to know. They had to learn this from that. It's not just good from evil. It's visible from invisible. And they also had to c continue to eat from the tree of life because the tree of life represents the divine connection between the heaven and the earth that resides in our heart. So, 
what I want to encourage you is, if you, if you like symbology, dig into it. It's wonderful. But take this away. There was never any original sin. There was never any <laughs> mistake. The love that created us stayed with us and gives us a consciousness of God, of Eden, which is an awareness of bliss and oneness and all of the wonderful things that we experience when we know and we sit in the presence. And it also gave us the passion to move out of that garden into this world to create joy, love, peace, and all the good stuff that God's proud of. So there's never any sin. There's no need for shame. There's no need for shame. Namaste. So I'll take a deep breath and hold it for just a second and then release it. Once again. And in this time, it's easy to move within to the Garden of Eden, the consciousness that exists within us, where we know there's only one power, one presence, one mind, one life. And we feel the peace. We feel the wonder. We feel the joy, the wisdom of this presence and power within us. And we can rest assured that as we move from this place of peace, and joy, and love, that our Maker the bestower is always with us, guiding and directing even when we think it's not. Guiding and directing us to the right people, the right places, the right time. So we set down any fear or false thinking. We set aside past experience no longer serve us because they were ignorant experiences where we forgot. And we move forward today enthusiastically, enthusiastically being the light, the love, the wisdom of the divine. Everywhere I look, I see the face of God. Everywhere I look, I see the face of God. Namaste.